This study of dispensations is mainly for the many Christians that don't believe in them. They fear that we are trying to take parts of the Bible away from them. And while all Christians should have a healthy concern about losing the Bible or parts of it, they should at least try the spirits and search the scriptures. It is hoped that after they search the scriptures that they can come to some of the same conclusions. So since we might be dealing with a nervous Christian, let me remind you that we were commanded to study in 2 Timothy 2.15. You may have been under the teaching of certain individuals that never wanted you to study. Anytime you ask them a question, you get reminded that we need to stay focused on what's important. Basically, they want to avoid subjects that might take away from the offering plate. So they stick with John 3.16. This helps them concentrate on what's important to them, the bottom line, and getting along with everyone in a hypnotic trance of sweet tenderness. So I'll start off with something simple like ice cream. Now, I'm an only child born from an only child, so if I ever serve my son a bowl of ice cream, there is no problem because without siblings running around, nobody is going to analyze how much I dispense into a bowl. But one time, my son had some friends over. These friends of his were three brothers. And since I'm an only child, I'm not used to having someone judge my every move. But these three brothers were analyzing the precise amount of ice cream I was dispensing to each and every bowl. The very idea of giving one of them a little bit less or extra didn't even dawn on me. I'm just not used to having to be extra careful, but even the best ice cream servers probably couldn't get each dispensation to be perfectly equal down to the microscopic, let alone subatomic level. And when God dispenses rules and regulations, they are often different for some people. When I was very young, I was not supposed to handle sharp knives. This is also called the power of negative thinking. And yet when I got older, my parents wanted me to put away the washed and dried dishes back in their proper place. You see, the older I got, the rules changed. Had I been disobedient, I would have followed the original instructions from my youth when I was told to not handle the sharp knives. Something similar happened to Moses. When the Israelites were thirsty, God told Moses to strike the rock and water would flow out of it. Much later, the people were thirsty again, and God instructed Moses to this time speak to the rock and water would flow out of it. But Moses fouled up and did what worked the first time. Now, true, God went ahead and honored it on behalf of the people, but he was displeased that Moses did not obey his new instructions. That's what we mean by rightly dividing. We're not telling you to take out parts of the Bible. We're telling you that there are different instructions given to different people at different times. Now, you might have run into some people that told you to remove parts of the Bible, and they may indeed have called themselves dispensationalists, but you can't judge us by them. Lots of people claim to be Christian, but you shouldn't believe that they represent true Christianity. As we continue in this basic study, you no doubt acknowledge that there is a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? Well then, congratulations. Whether you like the word or not, you are a dispensationalist, and God gives dispensations to different people. People from around the world can view these videos that I make, but my primary audience is an American one. Americans have been taught to think that everything should be fair and evenly divided. So when someone comes along and tells them that things are different, we kind of bristle at that. We're not sure if we agree or like hearing that. But we were told to study and rightly divide. If you don't do that consistently, then you'll have trouble when you get to places in the Bible that seem to contradict other places. In the New Testament, there are three places where Christians get tripped up the most when they forget to rightly divide. Those places are Matthew, which doctrinally is still under the law, even though it's getting you ready for a transition. The book of Hebrews will get you ready to transition into a time of Jacob's trouble. And the book of Acts gives people the most trouble overall. Failure to rightly divide the book of Acts will stick a New Testament Christian right back under the law. And you'd be surprised how many denominations want to get you back under the law. The trouble starts off in chapter 2. Beware of denominations get their start and foundation from Acts chapter 2. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Now, you'll notice that Peter didn't say for you to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and accept him as your personal Savior, nor did he mention the Romans' road to salvation and how the wages of sin are death, and behold, I stand at the door and knock, or all of those verses that you're familiar with. He said, repent and be baptized. So up pops numerous denominations that point to Acts 2.38 as necessary to wash away your sins. We affectionately refer to those people as water dogs. They just love that water. We like to think that we are in God's army, yet for some reason some people tend to think of it as God's navy. But we Bible believers that rightly divide know that water doesn't save you. It just makes you wet. We get baptized as a public profession of our faith in Jesus Christ. In Romans 6, 4, it says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That's why we put somebody underwater. It's a symbol of burial. And then the resurrection. You don't take a dead person and lean their body up against a tree somewhere and then sprinkle some dirt on them thinking that'll take care of it. But you'll find many churches sprinkling babies and then get mad at you for growing up and realizing that that wasn't biblical, and they get mad at you for seeking to get that corrected. But the book of Acts is a transitional book, where the dispensation given to the Apostle Paul was changing things. And so these groups that overemphasize Acts chapter 2 need to keep on reading. There seems to be something happening in between chapter 7 and chapter 8. Now, your mileage may vary, but I teach that there's three groups of people that rejected Jesus. First off is the Sanhedrin. They flatly rejected Jesus. The second group of people that rejected him were the everyday people, the ones that cheered him a few days earlier with palm leaves, and then they end up yelling, crucify him. And, of course, his very own disciples fled when Jesus was arrested. So, beginning in reverse order, when Jesus rose again and appeared to his disciples, they came back to him. So far, so good. Then in Acts chapter 2, Peter starts preaching to the regular people, and they accept his message. And many people start to come to the disciples in chapter 3, 4, 5, and 6. Things are looking good. Now, if only that ruling class, the Sanhedrin, if only they will accept this message. And of course, you know what happens. They grab Stephen, and Stephen starts preaching to them, and they reject Stephen's message. They beat his brains out. And then a great rift happens. Not one that you can see right away, but it's there just the same. It's as if God put the Jewish nation on hold, and he turned his attention to the Gentiles. Now God starts working on some Samaritans. And the first Gentile believer gets saved. In Acts chapter 8, we have the Ethiopian who gets saved, and that's why modern versions drop verse 37 clean out of the Bible. In chapter 9, Paul gets saved. Now you might say, hey, he's a Jew. Yes, that's right, but he becomes the apostle to us Gentiles. That's why we Christians living in this current dispensation concentrate on the writings of Paul. Not that we discount the other parts, but we know what's written directly to us. And on average, the Bride of Christ is mainly made up of former Gentiles. Acts chapter 10, God wants Peter to go preach to some Gentiles, and Peter doesn't want to. Peter didn't know there had been a change. God gives Peter a vision of unclean animals that God has now declared clean. So Peter goes and Peter starts in on his sermon. And like a lot of preachers, he sometimes reuses old messages. And just about the time he's getting ready to say, repent and be baptized, the Holy Spirit interrupts the message and Peter recognizes it as a sign to him. And so now Peter knows there's been a change. So in chapter 11, Peter starts back for Jerusalem. And as he's walking along, he starts rehearsing all that just happened. Why is he rehearsing? He's getting all the facts straight so he can present them to his fellow Jews. He's thinking to himself, they're never going to believe me. And after Peter tells them what happened and they start to get reports from other disciples, they make it official. Something has definitely changed. And this happens just in time, as some people in chapter 15 start to get things all out of whack by insisting that Gentile converts need to keep the law of Moses. But now, in chapter 16, when someone asks how to get saved, they aren't told to get baptized. They're told to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now, if you don't recognize that that is different, then I can't help you. Beware of someone who tries to get you to go back to doing things the way they used to do in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we had a priest, and they wore a long robe. But that's not where we are today. A lot of these different groups get their ideas from the Bible. They just don't know how to rightly divide the scriptures. Today, if you are a Christian, then you are the priest. A lot of people have been taught wrongly. They've been taught that the Old Testament people got saved looking forward to the cross. And today that we get saved by looking back to the cross. But that can't be right. Nobody was looking forwards and hoping for a cross. Whenever Jesus would bring up the subject of him dying and being turned over to the Gentiles, the disciples couldn't understand it. Even Peter said, no, sir, that's not going to happen. All we Bible believers are saying is that people in other dispensations didn't get saved like you and I get saved. They didn't get born again. They're saved, but your salvation is the new birth. When God revealed the future to his prophets, he didn't show them the church age that we are in. Someone like Daniel could see the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and even the Antichrist, but he didn't see us. And I mentioned earlier that our Apostle Paul wrote specifically to us. The whole Bible is for us to read and understand and to memorize. But when we want to get our doctrine straight on how we, the Church of God, the Bride of Christ, gets born again, then we need to be very familiar with these books. If it helps you to think of it as a timeline, then we are located in those books. But then, at the catching away, we will be gone and God will then start working on the Jews again. God has not done away with them. He sort of pressed the pause button on them. Our apostle to the Gentiles tells us that today the Jews are partially blinded. Now I've given you the most basic of introductions to this subject. Some people will disagree as to how many dispensations there are. I won't be dogmatic as some of these tend to overlap. There's probably going to be an eighth dispensation called Eternity Future. During the dispensation of law, we had the minor alteration, allowing for the sure mercies of David. And although still under the law, the slight addition of water baptism shows up. And as far as rules and regulations go, mankind started off being vegetarians. And that would have lasted 1,656 years. Although it wouldn't surprise me if sinful man would have been experimenting at some point. And then coming off the ark, Noah was told that he could eat all the animals, and that God would put fear of man into the animals. It's at this point that I think the animals became what we now call wild animals. But with the Mosaic Law comes dietary restrictions, where they couldn't eat pork and other animals. And now, living in this age, we can go back to eating all meats again, but one detail remained the same. We are to avoid blood. And while our Apostle Paul didn't have us continue with the Sabbath observances because they were assigned to Israel, not the church, but during the millennial reign, the Sabbath observances will start up again. As you can see, this is quite the deep subject of study. You don't need to be an expert on this subject, but you do need to know enough to recognize when someone is trying to take you back to being under the Mosaic Law. Take this strange website, for example. Here's a guy who obviously doesn't know how to rightly divide. He thinks we need to remove the book of Galatians. You see, it's not us dispensationalists that you need to worry about. It's guys that don't believe in dispensations. These guys in the Hebrew Roots movement can't handle the apostle to the Gentiles. They will have you questioning if Paul wrote the book of Galatians. Therefore, they don't believe God was capable of preserving his word. And you need to be aware of people that declare things are obvious. They're easier to spot. They all act like they were witnesses to the original manuscripts and that today we need their guidance to find out what God really meant to say. It's as if the Holy Spirit wasn't able to get anything done until these guys with their impressive wisdom showed up. And now the revivals are going to come at last. Here's another ginger peachy fellow telling us that our Apostle Paul was actually working for the devil. And this church age teaching of being saved by grace was actually the master plan of Satan. And you'll never guess what they recommend to avoid being deceived by Paul. Ah yes, keeping the commandments. 
They want you right back under the law. Now, if you still don't want to be a dispensationalist, but claim that you are a Bible believer, well, I wish you well. I really do. But you are going to end up struggling a lot more than you need to. You could put handcuffs on yourself and walk around and manage to get around and perform certain tasks for a while, but you've sure made it difficult on yourself when it didn't need to be so. And now you're less effective when you need to go and serve the Lord. Have you ever tried to turn the pages while being handcuffed? I'm getting a lot of mileage out of this analogy, but let's face it. It's not just the hands, but you are limiting your knowledge of the scriptures, your ability to witness, your ability to answer questions, and your ability to teach others. But do yourself a favor. Search the scriptures to find out if what I'm telling you is so or not.